My next guest is a sociobiologist, futurist, and author. That's a big business card. Uh, she has some ideas about how these wildfires could affect our future. Rebecca Costa, welcome back to the program. Haven't seen you in a while, but always enjoy your visits. So how do these fires affect our future? Well, they affect us in a number of ways. Obviously, the fires are being exacerbated by drought, which has caused this tinderbox in the forest and, uh, and uh, w historic winds, uh, drought, um, we just, you know, we, 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 it's okay up to a point to wonder whether climate change is occurring or is just a passing phase, but we don't really have any predictive models that show that conditions, ground conditions are going to get better. In fact, the IPCC uh, just came out with uh, a, a report just the other day uh, that indicates that, you um, uh, we probably will surpass a two uh, degree centigrade increase in the global temperature uh, by year 2050, I believe it is. Yeah, uh, I'll be honest with you. I'm a big fan of, uh, of global warming, and I'll tell you why. It's pretty simple. You see where I'm sitting here? 11,700 years ago, it was three quarter mile thick ice. You see, global warming brought me Lake Michigan and Lake Superior and Lake Huron and the Mississippi River. And so by extension, jazz, the blues and Cajun food. You see, so I'm OK with global warming because it gave us as a futurist, gave me all those wonderful things. Am I wrong? Well, you know, there's a there's a plus side and a negative side to everything that which occurs. And let me just say this for people who don't want to believe the models and the forecasters. There are no facts about the future. I'm a futurist, and so I get to say there are no facts about the future. There are only probabilities. And all of the AI-based uh, computer models that we have right now show that uh, it's not looking good for the next 50, 100 years. Uh, and, and even those that are very optimistic, what I call green wishing, uh, you know, where suddenly uh, the entire world is going to uh, be able to survive on renewable energy, which we've done the energy calculations. That's absolutely impossible. But, uh, but you know, even those people that are green wishing and fantasizing accept the fact that the most, even if we, we did everything possible, humanly possible, and forget whether humans caused it or not, not interested in that. What I'm interested in is can humans well, do anything? Well, that's kind of important. Now, hold on, hold on, hold on. You have to be interested in that because you got to look at some facts here. You know, glaciers now, have been shrinking matter. since 1820. Um, yeah, you know, when John Muir went to Glacier Bay, the one thing that was missing at Glacier Bay was glaciers. What's it, it, that? It doesn't matter at this point whether humans caused it, how much humans caused. It doesn't matter. The more important question is can we do anything about it? No. Well, I, I think your simple answer is no, uh, because the last ice age ended 11,700 years ago. You have interglacial periods in which we're in one now. And in fact, during the last interglacial period, 120,000 years ago, roughly, uh, the temperature on the surface of the planet was nine degrees higher Celsius, which is about 14 and a half degrees higher Fahrenheit than it is today. We've got a long way to go to catch up to the last interglacial period. Oh, and by the way, uh, when you have interglacial periods like that, there's a lot of moisture, there's a lot of heat, and heat and moisture create one important thing, life, lots of it. Plants, animals, they thrive. I mean, but, but I'm kind of an optimist, I'll give you that. that. We have geoengineering and we have technology and we have forecasting models. We have a lot of tools and the capabilities uh, at our disposal that were not available when we were first, you know, crawling out of the caves. So there is a possibility that we can limit the amount of additional heat that because if we don't, uh, we we uh, we're in for a really rough road, not not you and I, but generations to follow. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say this. The idea that humans think they can just go run up to the world thermostat and set it. It's not really possible. And and the we, second we, we, point we, that I would make is. But but we can try to cap the worst case scenario. That is mm -hmm. what all climatologists uh, and people that are studying climate change are trying to do. 
Originally, our target well, well, was... Well, not everybody, because you might want to speak to the Chinese about that. The Chinese are building 200 coal-fired power plants as we speak today. Yes. 200 being built. So if coal is your problem because America and the EU are bulldozing coal-fired power plants, you may want to speak to the Chinese uh, about the 200 plants, 60% of which in their country, the rest all over the world for places that they're taking up residency, like Costa Rica and, and uh, parts of South Africa and Namibia. If they're going to build yes. coal-fired power plants everywhere, the Chinese obviously not too terribly concerned about their global climate carbon footprint. And so but, but, I guess that leaves us in the dark. Let's talk about a bigger issue, because there's a bigger issue, isn't there? And that whenever it comes to solving a systemic global problem, we suck. We're, you know, let me use a scientific term, right? We suck. We're terrible at it. I mean, when it mm. comes to nuclear disarmament, when it comes to human rights, when it comes to, you know, pollution, we, we can't get together. I, I'm going well, gonna, gonna, gonna to respectfully any. disagree. I am going to respectfully disagree. Okay. Because in 1973, the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland was on fire because it was so polluted. Lake Erie was the laughing stock of the world because it was so full of filth because yeah, Milwaukee and Chicago and everything. Now, hold on, hold on, shoved all their trash down there. Now, the Great Lakes and Lake Erie are the cleanest in the world. America has cleaned up its act since the, in, the beginning of the EPA in 1973. It's been dramatic improvement. I'm talking about when, when we have a problem where the world has to cooperate, as in the WHO and the, the escape of the coronavirus, where we have policy that all nations have to cooperate or it doesn't make any sense, we're not good at it. Which fully emphasizes why America should be in charge. I cannot disagree with you because we get things done and we cleaned up the world with the EPA. I, I gotta leave it right there. You're always a, a hoot to talk to, Rebecca Costa. I always enjoy you being here, uh, and we will talk again soon. Thank you for having me.